Hey, welcome back. In this episode, we're going to learn about DevOps project selection. That includes greenfield and brownfield projects. This includes understanding greenfield and brownfield projects. My name is Sushant Sudish and I'm your trainer for this Microsoft certified Azure DevOps Engineer Expert Certification course. So without wasting any more time, let's get into it. The terms greenfield and brownfield have their origins in residential and industrial building projects. A greenfield project is one done on a greenfield, that is undeveloped land. A brownfield project is one that was done on a land that was previously used for other purposes. Because of the land use that has previously occurred, there could be challenges with the reusing the land. Some of these would be obvious like existing buildings, but could also be less obvious like polluted soil, etc. The same terms are routinely applied to software projects and commonly used to describe DevOps projects. On the surface, it can seem that greenfield DevOps project would be easier to manage and to achieve success. There was no existing code base, no existing team dynamics of politics, and possibly no existing rigid processes. Because of this, there is a common misconception that DevOps is really only for greenfield projects and that it suits startups best. However, a large number of very successful brownfield DevOps projects have occurred. The beauty of these projects is there is often already a large gap between the customer expectation and what is being delivered. And the teams involved may very well realize the status quo needs to change because they have lived the challenges and the limitations associated with what they are currently doing. So let's understand how you can choose greenfield and brownfield projects. When starting a DevOps transformation, you might need to choose between greenfield and brownfield projects. So let's understand how you can choose between greenfield and brownfield projects. A greenfield project will always appear to be easier starting point because a blank slate offers the chance to implement everything the way that they want. You might also have a better chance of avoiding existing business processes that do not align with your project plans. For example, if current IT policies do not allow the use of cloud-based infrastructure, this might be allowed for entirely new applications that are designed for that environment from scratch. As another example, you might be able to sidestep internal political issues that are well entrenched. So how can you choose brownfield projects? While brownfield projects come with the baggage of existing code bases, existing teams, and often a great amount of technical debt, they can still be ideal projects for DevOps transformations. When your teams are spending large percentage of their time just maintaining the existing brownfield application, you have limited ability to work on new code. It's important to find a way to reduce that time and to make software releases less risky. A DevOps transformation can provide that. The existing team members will often have been worn down by the limitation of how they have been working in the past and be keen to try to experiment with new ideas. There are often systems that the organizations will be currently depending upon so it might also be easier to gain stronger management buy in for these projects because of the size of the potential benefit that could be derived. And management might also have a stronger sense of urgency to point brownfield projects in an appropriate direction when compared to a greenfield project that don't currently exist. Eventually, the goal will be to evolve your entire organization. In looking to take the first step, Many organizations start with a greenfield project and then move on from there. When selecting systems and candidates for starting a DevOps transformation, it's important to consider the types of system that you operate. Some researchers suggest that organizations often use bimodal IT, a practice of managing two separate coherent modes of IT delivery, one focused on stability and predictability and the other on agility. So let's understand what is systems of record. 
Systems that are considered to be providing the truth about data elements are most often called as systems of record. These systems have historically evolved slowly and carefully. For example, it is crucial that a banking system accurately reflects your bank balance. Systems of record emphasize accuracy and security. So what is systems of engagement and how can you choose systems of engagement? Many organizations have other systems that are more exploratory. These often use experimentation to solve new problems. Systems of engagement are ones that are modified regularly. Making changes quickly is prioritized over ensuring that the changes are right. There is a perception that DevOps suit systems of engagement more than systems of record. But the lesson from high-performing companies show that this is just isn't the case. Sometimes the criticality of doing things right with the systems of record is an excuse for not implementing DevOps practices. Worse, given the way that applications are interconnected, an issue in a system of engagement might end up causing a problem in a system of record anyway. Both types of systems are important. When first starting a DevOps transformation, DevOps practices apply to both types of systems. The most significant outcomes often come from transforming systems of record. So let's understand how can you select groups to minimize initial resistance. Not all staff members within an organization will be receptive to the change that is required for a DevOps transformation. In discussions around continuous delivery, users are often categorized into three general buckets. Canaries, early adopters, and users. Canaries are who voluntarily test bleeding edge features as soon as they are available. Early adopters who voluntarily preview releases considered more refined than the code that canary users are exposed to. Users are who consume the product after passing through canaries and early adopters. While development and IT operation staff might generally be expected to be less conservative than users, their attitude will also range from very conservative to early adopters and to those happy to work at the innovation's edge. Let's look at some of the ideal scenarios. For a successful DevOps transformation, the aim is to find team members that with following characteristics. They already think they are in a need to change. They have previously shown an ability to innovate. They are already well respected within the organization and they have a broad knowledge of the organization and how it operates. And, and ideally, they already believe that DevOps practices are what is needed. So let's discuss ideal target improvements. It is also important to roll out changes incrementally. There is an old saying in the industry that any successful large IT systems was previously a successful small IT system. Large scale systems that are rolled out all at once have a very poor record of success. Most fail no matter how much support management has provided. When starting, it is important to find an improvement goal that can be used to gain early wins and is small enough to be achievable in a reasonable time frame and has benefits that are significant enough to be obvious to the organization. This allows constant learning from rapid feedback and the ability to recover from mistakes quickly. Please note that the aim is to build a snowball effect where each new successful outcomes adds to previous successful outcomes. This will maximize the buy-in from all those are affected. Let's identify project metrics and KPIs. I spoke earlier about the importance of shared goals. As well as being agreed by team members, the goal needed to be specific, measurable, and time-bound. To ensure that these goals are measurable, it is important to establish and agree upon appropriate metrics and key performance indicators. While there is no specific list of metrics and KPIs that apply to all DevOps projects, Let's discuss some of the commonly used metrics and KPIs. Let's start with understanding the faster outcomes. The first one is deployment frequency. 
Increasing the frequency of deployments is often a critical driver in DevOps projects. Another metric is deployment speed. As well as increasing how often deployments happen, it's important to decrease the time that they take. The third metric is deployment size. How many features, stories, and bug fixes are being deployed each time? And finally, lead time. How long does it take from starting on a work item until it is deployed? Another metric or KPI is efficiency. The first one we are going to look into is called server to admin ratio. Are the projects reducing the number of administrators required for a given number of servers? Another metric is staff members to customers ratio. Is it possible for less staff members to serve a given number of customers? Third is application usage. How busy is the application? And the fourth metric is application performance. Is the application performance improving or dropping based on the application metrics? Let's look at other KPIs. This time it's quality and security. This is where first you will discuss deployment failure rates. How often do deployments and or applications fail? Second is application failure rate. How often do application failures occur and such as configuration failures, performance, timeout, etc. Mean time to recover is where you will ask like how quickly can you recover from a failure? Another one is bug report rates. This is where you will ask, you don't want customers finding bugs in your code. Is the amount they are finding increasing or decreasing? Another metric is test pass rates. How well it is your automated testing working? Another stage is defect escape rate. What percentage of defects are being found in production? In the availability is what percentage of time is the application truly available for customers. And SLA achievement is where you will ask, are you meeting your service level agreements? And finally, mean time for detection is where you are going to ask, if there is a failure, how long does it take for it to be detected? Finally, it boils down to culture. First key metric to measure is employee morale. Are employees happy with the transformation and where the organization is heading? Are they still willing to respond to further changes? This can be very difficult to measure, but is often done by periodic anonymous employee surveys. Another key metric to observe is retention rates. Is the organization losing staff? Please note that it is important to choose metrics that focuses on specific business outcomes and that achieve a return on investment and increased business value. That concludes this lesson. In the next episode, we're going to learn about DevOps team structures. So I will see you on the next one. Until then, take care.